Hi guys, in this video I'm going to talk about classification problems in neural networks, what their outputs should be and what loss functions we should use. So for classification problems, um, the outputs and the loss functions are a bit more complex. There is a tight relationship between the two and we want the outputs of the neural networks to be something we can use and we want a loss function that will drive the neural network to give us what we want. So let's first look at the outputs. So if we denote the output of a neural network by y hat, so there's some input to the neural network x, there's the true values that we want to get, the y's from our data, and there's the y hat, which is what our neural network predicts for this observation. And this neural network, it has an input of x, and it's a function that is parameterized by w, by the weights of the neural networks, and we also sometimes denote these outputs as the final activations of the final layer, yeah, of layer L. Now we want the outputs of the neural network to be in a plausible range for our task. In regression problems, it's usually unrestricted. And so we could simply use the output of the final linear layer without any activation function or the identity activation function, if you will. If it is restricted, for example, if we know that the outputs have to be positive, we can apply some transformation, some activation function. So for example, in this case, we can use the exponent activation function. We'll just take the inputs to the final layer and take the exponent of them and then we get, and then the outputs have to be strictly positive. So this is for regression, but what happens for classification? Well, we have to think what we want the neural network to output. Let's first focus on the binary classifications. So binary is when we have two choices. For example, is the male spam or non-spam? So what we can do, we can use just one output neuron. And one thing we can do is draw a line in the sand and say, everything on this side is class one, everything on this side is class zero. So everything on this side is spam and everything on this side is not spam. Okay, and in the case of a single neuron, then this line is, here I drew it as a two-dimensional line, but in here it will be just a one-dimensional line. So we can say that on our one-dimensional line, everything that is above zero is spam, and everything here is not spam. So this is one possibility, but it raises the question, what loss function will we use to give us this result? And so what is usually done is taking a variation on this that also has a probabilistic meaning. So instead of looking at the output as giving whatever number and then saying, well, if it's above zero, it's this, and if it's below zero, it's this, we turn it into a probability. We say that the output gives us the probability of being in class one. And then if it's above 0 0.5, maybe we decide that we label it as spam. And if it's below 0 0.5, we label it zero, it doesn't have to be 0 0.5, it can be whatever threshold, whatever line in the sand that you want, but this gives a probabilistic meaning to the output of the neural network. So in order to get there, we need to transform the final layer into a number between zero and one. Luckily, we have the perfect activation function for that, which we already saw, the sigmoid. So suppose the input to the final layer is just, is just one dimension in the real line, the sigmoid is this function, and then the sigmoid, which gives us the probability p, lies between 0 and 1. Now, this is for the binary case. What happens in the multiclass? In the multiclass, we have c classes, for example. So we could use c neurons, and one thing we could do is say, okay, let's choose the neuron with the greatest value. Okay, so we have a neural network. It gives us, let's say, three output neurons, yeah, and suppose this a neuron, the middle one, has the highest value, we say that this is the true class. So if this neuron represents class A, this class B, and this class C, we say that the class is class B. We predict or we label the input uh, as class B. And again, this raises the question, how do we create a loss function or which loss function we can use in order to drive the outputs to be as close as possible to the true labels? So there could be maybe other loss functions, but what is usually done is, again, taking the outputs and transforming them into probabilities. So we transform this vector of numbers into probabilities, such that the sum is equal to one, and we choose the highest number, which is the highest probability. 
And luckily we also have an activation function that does that for us. It's called the softmax and it's a generalization of the sigmoid to C classes or C dimensions. So now our inputs to the final layer live in R C, so C dimensions. Once we pass the softmax, it takes each element of this vector, this Z1 to ZC vector, it takes the exponent of them and then it normalizes it. It divides each one by the sum of all the elements such that the sum of the elements are equal to one. So if before we were living in this R to the power of C, now after the softmax, we are living in the probability simplex, meaning that all the values of the softmax activations are above zero and the sum of them is equal to one. Now, why is it called the softmax? Well, it's because it's sort of a soft maximum. If we had a real maximum function, then for this vector, it would give one to six and zero for the rest. And then if we took the dot product, we would get maybe the six, we would get the maximum. Here, it distributes the probability between them and it gives most of the probability to six, but it still gives some probability for the rest. And also notice the difference. Six to two is not that different in absolute terms, but it gives it much, much bigger probability than this, okay? So once we go to softmax, everything that is just a little bit more than the others becomes much more probable to be our class. Now note that the softmax is translation invariant, which means that if we take a vector and we move it, all of its elements by the same constant, the softmax of this vector is equal to the softmax of the original vector. And this property is used for computational reasons. So remember that e to the power of z's here, well, e to the power of x can get really big and it can be too big for our computers to handle, which creates numerical overflows. And so what we can do is scale the vector by subtracting the maximum value. So for example, here, the maximum value is six. We just uh, subtract six from all the elements. We get this vector, the softmax stays the same. So before we calculate the softmax, we first do this transformation and then we calculate the softmax. You might ask what happens to really small numbers? Well, our computers are also limited with really small numbers, but for really small numbers, it's not a problem because the worst case is that the element will become zero. So the computers know if, it be if it's below this number, we call it a zero. For really high numbers, the computer can't do it. It becomes infinity and then it doesn't know what to do anymore. And so we get an error. So these were the outputs. Now let's look at the loss functions. So for regression problems, a valid loss is the mean squared error, right? It looks like this. We take the mean of the squared error. And for a D dimension, the, we just use the norm over the difference between the vectors. And this drives the outputs, the Y hats, to be as close as possible to the true values, to the Ys. And so if it's below, it will try to be bigger. And if it's above, it will try to be lower. So this is for regression, but what will we use for classification? So since our outputs are now probabilities, we can use the maximum likelihood framework and try to maximize the probability of our data. In the binary case, we have the Bernoulli likelihood. And so this is the likelihood of our data and our model outputs probabilities. What we want is to maximize the probabilities given the true data but the probabilities are constrained by our models. So we want to change the weights of the neural network such that it maximizes the P when the Y is one and it minimizes the P when the Y is zero. This will maximize this quantity. And the P's are of course the outputs of the neural network. We can take the log transformation of this and since it's a monotonic transformation, the maximum of this will be the maximum of this. It's easier to work with the sums here instead of the products. And we want to maximize this quantity or minimize the negative of this quantity. In a multi-class, the likelihood looks like this. We are no longer only have two elements. We have C elements. The sum of them have to be one. So we can say that PI capital C is equal to one minus over the other C's, but it doesn't matter right here. And of course the PICs are still the outputs of the neural network. They sum up to one because we use the softmax. And here the y's are not just a scalar value like before, they are a one hot vector. So suppose we have three classes, A, B, and C. If the true class is B, then it will be a vector of zero, one, zero. If the true class is C, it will be a vector of zero, zero, one, etc. Okay, so notice that in this sum, okay, there will only be one element that is not zero. Most of the elements here will be zero, but one of them, for example, in this case, the second element will be one. And so we will be left with log 
of y hat that is belonging to the second class. Okay, so this is maximum likelihood. If we take the negative of these quantities, in the case of a Bernoulli or multinomial distribution, then this quantity, the negative of these log likelihoods, is called the cross entropy. And what it is, it's a measure of how much one distribution differs from a second distribution. Uh, it's also part of the KL divergence. Here I wrote the KL divergence. This part is the cross entropy. This part is the entropy. We treat this distribution, the distribution of the y's, the true y's, and this is given to us by the data. So this is why this quantity over here, since it only depends on the data, it's a constant to us. We can ignore it. The only thing that we can control and optimize is this thing over here by changing the weights such that the outputs here, the y hats, will be as close as possible to the y. And by doing this, we will minimize the cross entropy. Now let's visualize the binary cross entropy for a single observation. So this is the binary cross entropy. It's just the same quantity as before. Yeah, this quantity over here for one observation, only I took a negative of it. Now notice that when y is equal to one, we are only left with this term because this term cancels. And when y is equal to zero, this term cancels and we are only left with this term. So let's visualize these two terms, log of y hat in blue and log of one minus y hat in green. You can see that minus log of y hat, the loss here is minimal when y hat is one. So when y hat is equal to y, but as y hat grows further away from one, and remember y hat because it's an output of a sigma, it has to be between one and zero. So when it goes to zero, the loss grows and grows until it explodes exponentially. And so this loss, it drives the y hat in this case to be as close as possible to one. And for the green case for when y is zero, it drives the y hat to be as close as possible to zero. So we see that this loss really does what we want. It tries to push the y's to be as close as possible to the true labels. Now, by the way, cross entropy can capture the distance for any distribution of y in the range of zero one. It doesn't have to be just that y can be only zero or one. It can be also anything in between. Here's a 3D graph I made. The red axis is the true y. The green axis is the y hat. We can see that when y is equal to one, we get this graph over here, which the loss is minimized when y hat is also one. And this is basically the blue curve from before. And when y is equal to zero here, then uh, y hat is minimized at zero also here. And this is the green uh, line from before. So this view is the view at this graph from this direction, basically. And we can see that in between, if y is between zero and one, we get some interpolation between these two functions, but the minimum is always in this diagonal here. Okay, this, so the minimum will always be when y hat is equal to y. So this loss function always tries to push y hat to be as close as possible to y. Now this was the binary cross entropy, but the general discrete cross entropy is the generalization to more than just two values. So just as before, we are taking the log likelihood of the multinomial case, we take the negative of it, and now it became the cross entropy. The idea is exactly the same. Remember that for each observation, yi is a one-hot vector. So yic, the element in that vector, will be zero for most observation and will be one for just one observation. So from all of these terms, we will only get one minus log y hat for one observation, and we will try to minimize that quantity for that specific y. So how will it do it? It will try to maximize the probability of the corresponding neuron to be one, and this will drive the loss to be zero. So for example, suppose that these are the three classes that we have and that the true class is B, the loss for that observation uh, does not depend on these values at all because the y's uh, that multiply them are zero, right? Because the one hat vector for the true y is zero, one, zero. So we will only get that the loss is the negative log of this output. And so it will try to maximize the inputs to this neuron. By maximizing the inputs to this neuron, the probability, the outputs here will grow. And because of the softmax, these probabilities will also become lower. And so we will only focus on this neuron and 
The rest of the neurons for this final layer, they don't play any role. So the derivative here is zero. It will zero out all the rest of the derivatives that are related to this neuron. And we will only focus on this neuron and we will optimize the weights such that for this observation, the input to this neuron becomes as big as possible such that after the softmax, the probability here will be as big as possible and hopefully as close to one for that specific observation. So if we look at just the loss function with regard to this neuron, in this case, let's say it's y hat two, then this is how the loss function looks, okay? If this neuron outputs something that is more close to zero, the loss explodes, it tries to push the neuron output to be as close as possible to one. And this will minimize the loss for this observation. So this is all for this video. I hope it gave you some intuition behind what outputs we should use for classification problems and what are the losses that we use. In the next video, we are going to look at the derivatives of the softmax and the cross entropy. I'll see you there.